Yay. It's working and I'm not muted. It worked today. Oh my goodness. Your backup plan tribe. I'm so happy to have you here today. It's a great day in the neighborhood. Isn't that what we say? It's uh, I'm Tina. I'm over here with your backup plan app and I'm the creator and developer of your backup plan. I'm a best-selling author of In the Blink of an Eye. Remember Jeannie? That's how fast things happen in the blink or the snap of your fingers. I'm a financial advisor and emergency preparedness coach. I'm so happy to have you guys here. Please like, share, and subscribe to our channel down below. Um, press that subscribe button and, and share it because these stories are so incredibly good from our amazing guests. I can't tell you enough how many tips and tricks that you will get from each of our guests. We are on all podcast platforms. We are on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Pinterest. And I am going to make a song about that one of these days <laughs> because it, it needs a little bit more, a little jive to that component. We talk about real life stories with really amazing people like Kathy Gleason that we have on coming on our show today from New York. I can't tell you enough how much information she has for all of us today. Um, they talk about their life changing events and it could be a tragedy or a trauma, a sickness or an accident. And yes, it happens to all of us. And I'm so incredibly blessed by having all of our wonderful guests here for the last three seasons that we've been doing this and we're going into our fourth. I'm, I'm, I truly am blessed by our wonderful guests and our subscribers. Thank you so very, very much. You know, in the blink of an eye, that's how quickly something happens. And it's something life changing and it's something unexpected that hits you and you don't know what to do. And you're not given a five minute evacuation notice in most cases. That's wonderful if you are, but it's not like you get hit by a car and you say, hold on a second. I need my five minute evacuation notice. It doesn't work like that. So uh, there's no time to make other than right now to make the right choices, make the right decisions, the right emotions that you have around all of those questions are when you're not sick, when you're not dying, and when you're not incapable of talking or making decisions. That's when the time is right to do those kinds of things because you're in the right mental state of mind. We don't have choices in most cases. It just happens. And that's why are we actually prepared? You know, we created an app that organizes all of your details in one place in case of any medical emergency, any circumstance, a sudden death or an unexpected tragedy to avoid all those tremendous areas of for you and your loved ones. And it puts everything at your fingertips and it makes it easy for you to make a plan. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Because when the push, I guess it's when the shove, it's, what is that saying? When the push comes to shove, it's too much. You can't do it at that time. And I'm sure Kathy's going to talk about that. So let's get this party started with Kathy Gleason coming to us from New York. Welcome, Hi. welcome. Hi, Kathy. Hi. How are you? Thanks I'm, so much for having me today. Oh, you're welcome. I'm so excited to have you here to talk about this, this taboo subject. Right. And, you know, when we're given that option of now it's time mm -hmm. for us all to go to the hospice, that could be a song too. Um, then it's, well, what's going to happen now? There must right. be so much fear for the family and the loved one that needs, you know, that that's, that's a hard, hard change to make. Right, right. Well, if I've learned nothing in my many years on, on the, this planet so far, it's that hospice is really a gift. It's not something to be feared. And I'm happy to elaborate on that sure. as we go along. Yeah. So Kathy, yeah. 
comes to us from New York. She is a podcaster and a consultant for hospice homes um, in around her area. Mm -hmm. And she's worked in the industry for a very long time. And, you know, now what tips for the next steps, because we are not prepared. We're not prepared emotionally, no. spiritually, or even physically. And right. it's time that we do talk about it. And it's time that we look at options as well of what that will look like for us. Right. Right. Well, thank you for coming on our show. Sure. Today. Sure. Where did it all start for you? <laughs> well, you know, I'm going to say that I did not prepare for the life I have now. Life prepared me for it. And years ago, seems like eons ago, when I was in my, well, my late teens, my father was diagnosed with cancer. At that point, I had lost two grandparents, but I was a very tiny child and really didn't have any memories of that. I do remember that I did not go to any funeral home. So even in my late teens, I had never been to a funeral home for calling hours. I had never been to a funeral. And now we find that my father is diagnosed with cancer. <clears throat> but that's probably very common for most teenagers. Sure I mean, it is. We, as parents, we try to isolate children exactly. and stuff, right? From, from all of that. Exactly. Except looking back, that probably wasn't the best solution for my parents to make. And I can elaborate on that too, as we go along, but learning my father had cancer. The first question in my mind was, well, is he going to die? And I had just gotten engaged. I wanted my father to walk me down the aisle for my wedding. So I was very upset. When my parents wanted to talk about it and talk about the eventuality that mm -hmm. he was going to die at some point, I would avoid the topic. I didn't want to hear about it. I just was, everything was going to be okay. And that's, that's all I would think about. Well, it wasn't okay. He did not give me away for my wedding. My brother did. And at the funeral home, I probably wasn't the nicest person because I challenged many people that had not seen my father in years and all of a sudden show up at the funeral. So I was a little bit, well, snarky, probably. I don't like that either. No, but I got through it. And then I went back to work and you do what, I mean, gosh, that's what my mother did. My mother went back to work. So what do I know? I didn't know anything about grief. Yeah. Back to work. Everything's normal. I got married. I eventually got pregnant, went into labor, went to the hospital, and within 12 hours, the baby was born, whisked off to another hospital for intensive care, and the very next morning, my son died. Oh, my goodness. I had never seen my baby. I had never held my baby. No one ever took a picture of my baby. Oh, my goodness. All I had was just the remains of my body in that state and some very confusing memories of what had happened. Yeah. Then. Because you're kind of out of it, too. Exactly. Exactly. And my husband, of course, went to be with the baby. So I went through this on my own until eventually my, my mom came and my stepfather and in trying to really protect me because of this horrible event that I had gone through, they paid for a grave site. They paid for a marker stone. They attended the burial, but would not let me go. Oh, They wanted to protect me. They wanted to protect me. And they did. So what happens eyes. after that? In their, in their eyes. eyes. You know, that's all they knew to do. So I moved on. I stuffed it, went back to work. Same thing, same thing. Decades later, now I happen to be working at a nursing home. So I see the elderly around me every day. I know that eventually they die, but, you know, I was not really dealing with that. I was working in administration, so I wasn't doing patient care or anything. 
then my mother started to decline in her age. And she at first could no longer live independently, had to go into assisted living, had to have people help her do things. Yeah. I was only grateful that I didn't have to be her caretaker. My mother was the inveterate planner. She planned everything to the most minute detail. She went and described the funeral she wanted, paid the funeral director for it and her casket, had it all diagrammed out, almost an agenda for the day. Wanted to talk to myself and my brother. My brother lived in Florida. I lived near my mother. So every time I stopped over, she would say, Kathleen, I want to talk to you about my funeral. Oh, no, I cannot tolerate this topic. I would literally find a reason to leave. I would avoid the discussion at all costs. There were times she would set a time up for me to come over, an appointment with her own daughter to come over and talk. And when I got over, I would pretend that I got a message on my pager and had to leave. I just would not, would not talk to her about it. Well, eventually she went from assisted living to having to go to a nursing home and wound up at the very nursing home I worked at. Oh, wow. Well, that that created some problems because once she found out where my office was, <laughs> <laughs> which was in the basement... And that's an area that residents at the nursing home were not allowed to be in. That's where the kitchen was and storage and laundry. She would hijack the elevator. She found the password for the elevator in the nurse's station. She would put the passcode in the elevator to come to the basement and come to my office. Well, eventually they decided that that was unsafe and they put her on the fourth floor where she was not able to do that. You had, it was a whole different setup in the elevator. So she was stuck there. So during the day, a couple times a day, I would always make my way to the fourth floor. But every time I was there, I was so uncomfortable. That was the floor where the dementia residents were and the residents who pretty much had no family. That was where the tough cases were. And now my mother was there. Oh, dear. And she started to decline. Well, since she was a resident of the nursing home, they have policies, they have standard meetings. I had no choice but to participate in those meetings. And those meetings were to plan the what ifs. What if she becomes terminally ill? What if she gets an infection? What if she has to go to the hospital? We had to answer all of those what ifs. What did she want done? She but only still, staff had to answer those, right? No. The staff or no. the family had to answer them. You yeah. Did. Okay. My mother and I did. And if my mother was unable to, then it was my decision okay. because I was signed on as her health care proxy. Okay. Again, my brother was in Florida. He was right. there for me to consult with, but basically it was on my shoulders. So mom and I were forced into those discussions and I had to sit there now and go through it. And no choice at all. So I became a little more inured, I guess, to the fact that eventually she was going to die. She didn't have a life-threatening illness. She didn't have a heart condition. She was just getting older. And what it's called at that point, when they get so old that they're just not doing well, they call it failure to thrive. And it's a pretty sad way to die in my book. Because your body just kind of wastes away. Yeah. And that's what happens. It's like it gives up. Yeah. First, you, you can't quite swallow as well. So they thicken your food. It doesn't look appetizing and probably doesn't taste appetizing either. And then it's just a variety of things that you have to have more help every day with. Eventually, the time came when the doctor said to me, Kathy, she's probably only got a few months left. We need to talk about hospice. Okay. I thought I knew what hospice was. You know, hospice is what you do. You just sign the papers and they just take care of the patient. Well, no, not so much. A lot of decisions have to be made. You have to know what you want done. 
when my mother was no longer able to eat anything, what did I want done? Yeah. When she couldn't swallow liquids, what did I want done? If you're on hospice, you give up all of those life-saving measures that have to do with the disease that's taking their life. So we were faced then with just treating her symptoms and keeping her pain free. Right. I was terrified. But looking back at it, I have to say, my mother was probably more comfortable in those months on hospice. I think she was on hospice for about three months. In those three months on hospice than she had been for the last two or three years of her life. She suffered anxiety and depression. And all of those symptoms, all of those pains were taken away from her. She was very quiet. She slept a lot, which is perfectly normal. But I was able to sit next to her bedside, hold her hand, and talk to her, just as if she were listening to me intently. Yeah. And and maybe she was. They say that the sense of hearing is the last to go. And my mother eventually died. But she died a very peaceful death on hospice. Oh, good. Very peaceful. So that made me feel a little more comfortable. Because her body just kind of shut down on its own? Just, she slept and just didn't wake up at one point. That's what it was. She was sleeping more and more until yeah. she just she slept her life away. It's like your body just exactly starts exactly. giving up. Exactly. What a nice way to go, actually. If you're it was. It was, go. it was beautiful and it was very peaceful. And I have hospice to thank for that. Shortly after that, I kind of grew tired of working at the nursing home. I was eligible for early retirement, so I took advantage of that Yeah, and started to do some consulting work. And I took my first job as a consultant at a hospice home in our area. And I thought, oh, gosh, here we are, death again. Why am I surrounded? That was my perception. Why am I surrounded by death? I went for the interview. We chatted. And I found that the office I would be using was in the basement. Everything medical was going on on the first floor. So I thought, okay, I can come in, go right down to the office, stay in the basement. When I'm ready to go, I can go. No (laughs) problem. It won't touch me at all. I won't see it. I won't be near it because I knew in the hospice home, these people were there to die. That was their last stop. So I took the job and I started out. I was chatting with one of the nurses one day, and she said, you know, you should come up and meet this resident. She's just so, so sweet. You'd love her. Oh, no, no, thank you. You know, I, you know, I can't do it. I just can't be that close to death. So this wonderful nurse, Anne was her name. She waited another day <clears throat> when it was just she and I in the house. And she came down to me and she said, Kathy, I need your help. I said, what do you need? She said, I need to turn whatever the resident's name was, and I can't do it by myself. Would you just come up and let me use your hands? I'll tell you everything you need to do. You don't have to interact with anybody. Just come up and help me. Because she knows you. (laughs) Of course. What else am I going to do? Am I going to say no? I went upstairs. I helped her. She showed me what to do. And as quick as I could, right back downstairs to the office. Well, at different points, when it was just Anne and I in the house, she would need my help. And then another time, of course, the resident is awake and alert and talking. I can't be rude. So I started talking with the resident. And you get the idea. You get the picture. Gets more and more. Anne, Anne involved me more and more and more until I was there when a resident died. Oh, dear. I wasn't even there when my mother took her last breath, but I was there when this resident died. And I watched as Anne and the other nurse took care of this resident after her death. And I watched the loving care that they offered someone who can no longer feel, who no longer has any sensations, and it still brings tears to my eyes. Yes, oh, it would. So... I took a part-time job at this very hospice home 
and became more and more involved. It was still the administrative side of it, but I had more involvement with the residents and with their families. And you know what they did? They moved my office upstairs to the first floor. Ah. Just so I would be around more. Most of my engagement was with the families. And I saw what it did to the families. I saw how they came in there on their very first day or their visit, their tour, before bringing their loved one there. And I saw the burden. I saw the worn look on their faces. And then I saw them a month later when they were smiling and happy and laughing and comfortable with the journey that their loved one was on. It was it was mind-blowing. It was mind-altering for certain. It must be so scary, like your first day at school, you know, where yeah. you just don't know what to expect. You and don't everybody's know what worried. to expect. Exactly. Fear, exactly. Yeah, it can be terrifying. And then in the middle of it all, I went to the doctor with my husband, who had already had coronary bypass surgery and everything. Tom was a Vietnam vet. He'd served in Vietnam as a combat medic. I went with him to a doctor's appointment one day, got called into the doctor's office afterward to be told that my husband had an incurable form of cancer. He had a glioblastoma multiforme type four. And the doctor said to me, pulled me in the hallway, and he said, I can tell you only three things about this disease. Is the first that it's very unpredictable. The second is it's extremely aggressive. And the third is there is no cure. And your husband may have six months, one month, one year. Nobody knows. And I'm sure a lot of those listeners have had or know somebody. That's Absolutely. In that situation. Absolutely. The three worst things that you could tell somebody. Exactly. And I had never, other than when my father got cancer, but I was very young then. And it was my mother that was feeling probably what I felt in that moment. So Tom and I had eight months left. And at the end of his time, of course, I was taking care of him. I was his caregiver. And working. without And working, trying to work. But then eventually I stopped. The hospice home was extremely understanding and let me work part-time. They let me take work home, whatever I needed. And Anne, that wonderful nurse, was supporting me every step of the way, telling me what to expect, telling me what to advocate for through the many trials, the cancer trials, through the radiation, through the chemo, through the ugliness of it all. I cared for Tom. And then eventually it was time to put Tom in a facility because I could no longer take care of him myself. He wasn't there very long and it was time to think he, about hospice. What did he struggle with, Kathy? What was his? Well, it was a brain tumor. Okay. So he lost his sense of balance <clears throat> and he was a large man. So when he fell, he usually took me with him. So uh, there were many bruises, uh, many difficult times. I was not able to get him up off the floor yeah, or, or the yard if he fell outside. So I had to get help. Um, and it just got very, very difficult. Eventually, he struggled with language, with making his needs known. And we put him um, in a facility for veterans. He was very happy there because he loved veteran. He loved his brothers in arms. Yeah. And he actually enjoyed being there, I think. And then, of course, it was time to think about hospice for my husband. That's hard. Actually, it wasn't because I had such a different perspective of hospice then yeah. that I knew it was the right thing to do. Yes. And he went on hospice. And hospice is wonderful in that they also support the families. And so they were a wonderful support for me, as was the staff. And Tom passed very peacefully. Oh, that's good. Just kept him with the medicine exactly. to keep it under yep. control. Yep. Just I hear it's pain very free. powerful, very it painful. Well, th yes, that, that is very painful, but he suffered no pain, no pain at all. And again, it was a very peaceful passing. And I was very grateful for that. Yeah. So going from terrified of the word death through those four losses in my life, and then on a whim with my older daughter, 
deciding to start a podcast to talk about grief. Well, good for you. Because it's a hard topic, grief it and is. death. Yet the more we talk about it, the more we deal with it, the more comfortable it gets. And that's really all we want for everybody else. That's true. I think I that's why I do it. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of my shows are about grief right. and uh, it just seems to be that topic that mm -hmm. you just can't help people enough with. I mean, it's because I, everybody's grief is different. Yes. So it's hard to come up with a, you know, a, a formula. formula. Yeah. It's different. Um, and there are so many different types of grief too, because grief doesn't even necessarily have to be only suffering the death of someone. Yeah. But it can be losing your marriage to divorce. Yeah. It can be losing a job and losing the lifestyle that you've grown fond of. It can be losing your house because you couldn't pay for it anymore. It can be a variety of things. And I I also talk about professional sports players uh, mm -hmm. or professional yeah. who are incapable of continuing to play. And absolutely that is devastating for them. Absolutely. It's been their life. Right. And it can happen to anyone who suddenly suffers a disease that is life altering for them, too. Yeah. So, yeah, grief is all around us and especially with the pandemic. And I really think that that's why so many of our teens are having mental health issues is because of grief, because of what they went through themselves and had to give up their friendships, their relationships and all the activities and their normal daily life as a student, um, I, I think that's why a lot of them are suffering themselves. And don't realize it. You, you, know, you just don't know what that is inside. Exactly. Have exactly. you been able to release some of that grief from, from the past? Well, absolutely. Um, in fact, it probably wasn't until I was doing the podcast that a lot of that grief from the loss of my father, my infant especially, um, kind of came back to me. Mm -hmm. um, I was doing a podcast at one point and pretty much just broke down myself because it just came back. So I find That's the podcast very this. healing. There's <laughs> always <nearby>. tissues. <laughs> there are always <laughs> tissues at my desk, always. <laughs> but yeah, so the, the podcast has done a lot for me. Yes, very uh, healing. And, and I'm actually working on a book now uh, about Good. grief that will include a lot of my own grief journey um, oh good as, as well as things i've learned and maybe things that might help somebody else yeah that's awesome i'm going to take a quick second and sure. make sure that everybody likes shares and subscribes to our show because you want to subscribe so you know when we get back on with another guest and talk about different topics as well again and you don't want to miss any so just wanted to quickly put that in there. And um, I wanted to talk about, so does the doctor basically say it's time to think of a hospice for you? Well, Is the doctor how can. how it starts? The, the doctor can, but doctors are hopeful beings. They, they know of so many different treatments and clinical trials and everything that many times doctors themselves are reluctant to voice the word hospice. You're more apt, I think, to hear it from a nurse or maybe from a social worker. If your loved one is in the hospital, for example, your social worker might come to you and say, you know, what do you think? What do you think of hospice? However, I will say, knowing that if you as a family member are convinced that it's time and you have had a conversation with the doctor, the main criteria for hospice is that the person is deemed to be within six months of their death. If you as a family member know that, you can ask for hospice. You don't have to wait for it to be suggested. And in that case, you can contact the doctor and request it or you can contact the social worker who might be in charge of your loved one's case and request hospice. And they will provide you with the applications and get you on the path. 
So really people have a choice of going home, mm -hmm. staying in the hospital, if that's a possibility, if, because mm -hmm. a lot of times they want the bed, so right. they want you out. Right. Um, or hospice. Right. So it's not like there's a whole lot of choices. There aren't a whole lot of choices. And sometimes people will be on hospice in the hospital. But you're right, especially in today's healthcare, they want the bed. And after COVID, the beds are usually having people waiting to yeah. occupy them. In all so hospitals. They, yeah. So if someone is going on hospice care, the hospitals don't really like to keep them as an admission and they will try to help you find the social worker will try to help you find placement for your loved one. Yes. Your loved one can go home. They could go to a nursing home. If they're going on hospice and there are hospice homes in your area, they might also be able to go to a hospice home. The social worker is the one that really should make those suggestions to you about what options are available to you. And then it's a matter of finding the place of your choice that has a bed available. Right. Now, if you, if your loved one goes to another, like to a nursing home or to a hospice home, their care will be provided for them 24 seven. If they come home on hospice, you will still have the hospice team that will work with you. Chances are you will have a visit almost every day or daily by a member of the hospice team, usually the nurse. But it is usually the family themselves that wind up providing the care. And that is what can really, really wear a family out. Mm hmm and it wears on them, it wears on their emotions. It's very, very difficult. So if at all possible, I would encourage your listeners, your viewers to find a hospice home. That would be my first choice. Only because if, you've seen it yourself. <laughs> only because I've seen it myself, yes. If not that, a nursing home. Nursing home gives good care. But in a hospice home, you will find the number of residents is going to be fewer. So the obligation for staff to care for them is going to be less. In a nursing home, you can typically, on the night shift, you might typically have a certified nurse's aide responsible for 40 residents. That's a lot to be responsible for. Yeah. When these residents may have to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, may need to be cleaned up, may need whatever. Pills and stuff, medicine. Exactly, medication. There's usually a nurse available, too, for the medications, at least in New York State. But, but a hospice home is going to have fewer residents, so there's less of a burden on the staff. So that would be my number one recommendation for people. And if you don't know if there are hospice homes in your area, don't wait till you need one. Yes. Find that out. Find out what they are, what they're called in your area. Find out where they are and even go over and take a tour. Most of them are very welcoming and would love to show you their home. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I do agree. That in advance so that should the time come. Um, in, in fact, funny story, when my husband was in the hospital and they said, you know, he probably needs to go to a facility now and he'll be ready for hospice soon. I said, okay, the social worker came and she said, um, here's this application, I want you to look at it and just check off the facilities you would like me to see if they have beds. And I said, okay. Instead, I returned the application to her the next day, completely filled out, completely filled out. And I said, here you go, now you have only to fax it because I knew she was overwhelmed. She had a huge caseload. So I did that for her, but I knew exactly what I wanted. I knew where I wanted him to go. And it was check that and provide everything that needed. I had all the paperwork they needed and here it is, it's ready to go. And did, the people came from the facility the next day, did his assessment and accepted him. Did you feel you had a bit of guilt for yourself? 
I'm just thinking of listeners. Yeah. Feeling guilty. I did have some guilt, but in all honesty, I was so exhausted, so exhausted and so bruised that I knew it was the right thing and the only thing to do. I did not want him to stay in the hospital. And I had checked out the facility where he was going to be sent. I had confidence in their staff. I knew they appreciated and honored and respected the fact that he was a veteran and retired from the army because that's the type of facility it was. It Mm -hmm. was a veteran's facility. So I knew that's where he should go. I also knew that he would welcome the chance to meet other veterans like himself. Right. But, because he's still capable yeah. of doing that. Exactly. But yes, I understand that maybe a time that you feel horribly guilty. Yes. I had guilt later. I did have yeah. guilt later, even though I knew it was the right thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. I you almost need to have a few people around you as support to make those decisions so that it's not entirely just you. Right. I did. I had my older daughter, my younger daughter is in Texas, but my older daughter, the one that I do the podcast with, she was within 10 miles and she was constantly checking on me, going with me if I needed her to. Yeah. Always following up, you know, what's going on. Because then you have someone that you can converse with on the same level. Exactly. And, and kind of, feel comfortable with your decision. Exactly. Now you're a little bit different putting them into this hospice Mm -hmm. than some people because they're not familiar with it. But what did you experience with some families at the hospice? Well, some families obviously just weren't ready. They weren't ready to accept the fact that they were this close to losing their parent or their husband or their wife. So it was a real challenge for them. And over the course of the days, as they're there and they they begin to relax a little bit, and they see the volunteers and the loving care that they're given, the staff and the nurses spend time with the family members and talk to them about it and help prepare them for it. So the family kind of gets a little bit of an education, if you will. Yeah. And you can see people visibly start to relax and feel differently about it. So it helps in both ways. It also helps the resident because the comfort care homes that I deal with will not accept a resident who does not want to go there. They're, They're pretty tough on that. If the resident themselves is not ready to come to the comfort care home, then they won't accept them. Well, that's pretty strong. It it is pretty strong, but there's a reason for it. Because if they don't want to be there, they're not going to be very accepting of the care offered. And it's going to be counterproductive. And it's not going to be a good experience for them or for their family members. At the same time, when the comfort care staff go to do the assessment, and talk to the family. They take with them a booklet that has pictures of the comfort care home. They describe some of the other things that have gone on. There have been weddings at comfort care homes in the gardens in the backyard. We have um, the comfort care homes here have nice decks that you can walk out from the, the resident bedroom. And there have been a variety of animals, including a horse brought up to the deck and the resident wheeled outside to be able to cuddle with her horse one more time. I have seen the staff take a resident sailing who wanted only to go sailing one more time. And they took her sailing on the lake. So comfort care homes and hospice workers in general can be people that can make some last minute wishes come true, Mm -hmm. so to speak, and can help just help the family have some extraordinary memories. Especially when they're capable still. Exactly. Exactly. Because there must be a lot. What if they can't even know that they're there? Do they just stay in the hospital then if they don't no. are able? No, they can still to... come to the comfort care home at that point if they're unable, usually unconscious or something. They can come 
it's usually um, every situation is different. It's on a case by case basis. Yeah. So in, in that instance, or should someone come there and then become unresponsive, they still stay there. Uh, we encourage family to sit and talk with them. The TV might be on. We'll play their favorite music on the radio. Many times staff, the staff themselves will go in and sit down and just talk to the resident. Again, the theory is that hearing is the last thing to go. Yeah. So, yeah. I believe so even that. Even though they're unresponsive. And what kind of working with families did you finally, you know, I, I bet you didn't realize how they may have had some sort of plan or they see what the picture of the writing on the wall looks like, but they're still not very clear. So, yeah, um, usually the nurses or the director of the comfort care home, we'll sit and spend some time with the family and just talk to them about it and see where the conversation goes. They will take that opportunity to inform, to educate if they need to, to maybe talk over some, well, you know, is there anything special you would like to do? Like, do you want to have a big family dinner one more time? And they will do whatever they can to help make that possible. Well, Did that answer nice. your question? Yeah, that's very yeah. nice. Um, what about families that, you know, they've gotten this parent or spouse to a certain point and they have nothing planned, like nothing organized. Do they come in like that too? Like, Yeah, that happens too. You know, somebody is just kind of taking it step by step, so to speak. Um, of course, staff again will, will ask upon admission, do you have a funeral home chosen? Because at the time of death, that call needs to be made. What and percentage if, of people do you think in your experience? Now I would say it's probably a, a pretty low percentage. And it's probably because the diagnosis was... Quick? Yeah, it was quick. A surprise, not expected at all. Otherwise, you know, as people age, you start, to, you start to prepare and you start to think about that. I know there are always resistors. There are always people that just don't want to talk about it. Oh, yes. Yeah. Speaking to the choir here. Yeah. There are always people that don't want to talk about it. But I have to say, and I'll speak directly to those people now. So if you're listening and you haven't given any thoughts to your own plan, Listen to this. I consider my mother's minute detail preparedness the greatest gift that she, she ever left gave you. me. Absolutely. Even while she was alive, to make her wishes known, because when the doctor came to me and asked a question, what about? I had the answer because I knew what my mother wanted me to say. I didn't have to make a decision. I didn't have to struggle with the guilt. I was doing what my mother wanted me to do. And if there's one thing I learned as a child, you did what <laughs> your mother told you. <laughs> but all kidding aside, and then after her death, we changed one thing with her funeral. We changed the location. But to not have to make any of those decisions at that soul crushing moment. It, that we're well, you're incapable, right? That loss, that we're yeah. trying to accept that loss. Yeah. That was such an incredible gift. So if you haven't made your plans, consider it a gift to Absolutely. your children, to your loved ones. And to yourself that you will for take, that matter. You will take that burden off their shoulders. Yes. If I stress one thing, I can't stress that more. Yes. Yeah. Because I, what I've seen, I don't know if you have, but I have seen families sitting around arguing and fighting about Definitely. what mom wanted. Definitely. And who's right and who's wrong. I mean, yep. from the outside looking in to the family dynamics, right? everybody's right. 
Well, exactly. And yes, uh, there are kids that are going to feel stronger one way or the other. But again, if mom, dad, husband, wife, if whoever set it out in writing, there's no question. This is what I want. There can be no argument. Yeah. So, yeah. I agree. Definitely. And I didn't realize how many questions they ask at the funeral home. Oh, yeah. Like a lot of people that I saw coming in as husband and wife mm -hmm. or family yep. do not know half of the questions right. for the answers. Yeah. That's yeah. how many questions you're given. Yeah. Oh, exactly. My so, mother so, even had her own obituary written. Isn't that sweet? I, I don't know if I could write my own, even though I'm a writer. Well, I probably could, but. <laughs> I know, but, but how still, hard would that be? Still, you That's know, to incredible. have every, like I say, every single detail taken care of. And she paid for it too, which she didn't have to, but she paid for it too. Yeah. Do you think she did that after your dad died so that she saw the writing on the wall, so to speak? Um, I know she did it after my dad died. I think she might have done it anyway. I think she might have done it anyway. Because after an experience, yeah. it really makes you realize things yeah. differently, doesn't it? It absolutely does. It absolutely does. Yeah. Like... I have had clients where I'd say, well, what does your mom want? Oh, she's been vocal about that. And I'd say, well, what does your dad want? And I have no clue. No clue. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's what they say. It just, yeah. and they don't want to talk about it. Don't want to go there. Right. And I don't know if they care or don't care. Like mm -hmm. what is about all of that? I'm I don't think sure. I said they don't care. I think they just don't want to talk about it. They don't want to admit that it's a fact of life because yeah. we're never ready. We're never ready. No. I have a client too, who keeps saying, uh, when I feel better, I'm yeah. in, when I'll do it, when I feel better. When I feel better. Yeah. When is that exactly? Who knows? <laughs> yeah. Who knows? It's never yeah. going to be better. No. So no. yeah. Yeah. It's just an excuse, right. Yeah. To not look at it. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you know all of the excuses. <laughs> I've yeah, I could probably write a book of excuses. I, I really think we could. should. I think you should. <laughs> no, that wouldn't be that wouldn't be helpful to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> it might be kind of cute to read them all. Well, I will see. say that the thinking parenting theories now are changing. They are now encouraging people to take the earliest moment possible. Like if you have a toddler and you are walking the neighborhood and you see a dead butterfly, for example, to talk about that dead butterfly and talk about how every living thing will eventually die and start the conversation. And if you do in just very simple but truthful responses, yeah. answer any questions your toddler might have, when you're ready to talk about your death plans, because now you know better yourself, when you're ready to talk about them, your child won't make excuses. Yeah. I also see people scared to talk about it, to answer the questions, because they might think something's going to happen. Yeah. yeah. I don't know why that's in our head. Uh, you yeah. know, if we were that able to manifest things that efficiently we would all be rich from the lottery absolutely let's face it or in just love. because you yeah there you go but just because you say it does not mean it's going to happen yes yeah and we plan for trips and we plan weddings sure. and we plan sure. everything mm -hmm. but we plan big dinners and we plan christmas but for some reason yep. we don't want to plan what we want Right. And usually whatever we think is going to go wrong is not what does go wrong. It's something else. Yeah. That's yeah. kind of Murphy's law too. Exactly. Exactly. I know Murphy well. Yes. In my <laughs> life. Yep. I, I've sworn at Murphy a few times. <laughs> I have too. I have too. <laughs> um, so what I've experienced in a hospice is that it's very comforting. 
Mm -hmm. It's very, um, I haven't been to a hospital hospice, so I can't really talk yeah. about that. Although I think they might try and make it feel like with furnishings and mm -hmm. kind of like the special birthing rooms that some hospitals right. have. Right. Um, but I do know that the people that work in these care facilities mm -hmm. in particular are very, very um, nurturing yes. and, and caring. Yes. Oh, well, I guess they have to be to understand. They're there because they want to be. Yes. They're not there because of their paycheck. Yeah. Which is different than the hospital in a lot of cases. Yes, it can be. It can be. Yes. Because when you get a good nurse, you're very lucky. Absolutely. I tease my nurse friends that I'm keeping a list of all the nurses I want to care for me when I'm dying. So I told them all to be on alert. Yeah. Get a phone call. <laughs> yep. It's your shift. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, have you seen families fight when they're in there, when they get in there and have, you know, it is a very emotional. Sometimes it brings out the worst in everybody than the better. Yeah. Fortunately, I haven't seen a lot of that. There are families that obviously disagree. They generally will not do that in front of the resident. They may do it in the living area of the house, or they may take it outside. But there are obviously families that disagree about what's going on. There are families that may disagree with the medications. That's usually the, the biggest bone of contention. And for that, they really need to talk to the hospice doctor because it's the hospice doctor that's prescribing those medications. The nurses will and do make suggestions because they see whether it's taking care of the pain level or right. whether there's still agitation or breathing issues. So the nurses will suggest it, but ultimately it's the doctor that does the prescribing. So families are then directed to contact the doctor. But I have seen nurses spend, oh, so, so much time talking with family members, explaining things, helping them understand why something is done a specific way or why a certain medication is not used. And just a whole, a whole litany of things. The nurses and other staff at the hospice homes are always willing to discuss those things with family. And they try to lessen those disagreements in that way. I think if they and un families understood it better, like mm -hmm. like you said, mm -hmm. then then they're not so agitated, right, about right. it, right. And sometimes it's just that that family member themselves they're not ready, they they're not they've not accepted the fact yet. Yes. And so many times it's really that that is the difficulty, but it comes out in other ways. Right. That's the hardest part, actually. Right. Yes, it is. Because in the family, one might be ready and the other one isn't yet. Exactly. So you've got exactly. this. Exactly. Yep. Oh, dear. That's confusing. It's a very messy. difficult time of life and it can be very contentious. Hospice's aim is to make it as peaceful as possible and to allow the residents to die with dignity as well. And that's why I created the app, actually. Yeah. Because I felt the exact same way. Yep, yep. Because I felt that nobody should have to go through a messy afterwards. No, no. It should be easy transition and it should be not having to fight or argue with anybody or right. anything. It should right. be it should be all laid out and comfortable and it makes mm -hmm. you able to concentrate on yourself yep. and things around you and to properly grieve. Right. Is, was my whole essence of creating it. Yes. And those last days, those last moments, that last Are breath. Are very precious. That last breath is something that's going to stay in my head forever. Yes. Like you can't you know? take that away from anybody. That's, no, that's and I a wouldn't precious want it. time. Exactly. And I wouldn't want to have my husband's last breath create agony for me because of the way it went. Yes. And instead, 
uh, the memory I have of it actually puts a smile on my face because I was whispering in his ear, thinking, remembering, hearing is the last to go, whispering in his ear. And he took his last breath. And my first thought after that was, sure, you always said I would get the last word in. Yeah, yeah. And so now when I think of his last breath, I can think of that and I can smile. Yeah, it's like a little choke between you. It was a peaceful last breath. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's sweet. And that's the way it should be. Yes, absolutely. Right. Um, have you got any final messages for the listeners, even though I don't want to end the show? We could talk about this forever. <laughs> yeah, I know. This is one of those topics that you could go on forever. I guess maybe just two messages. The first, again, remember that if you have not made your decisions, you don't have to make the arrangements yet, but if you've not at least made your decisions and put it down on paper, not spoken it, put it down on paper. You can have it notarized. You can leave it with your attorney as part of your will. You can do whatever you want, but put it down on paper and make that a gift to your loved ones so that they won't have to make those decisions at a time in their life that utterly, utterly destroys them. Yes. That's the first. And the second, if you have young children, don't feel you have to protect them. Little ones are so resilient. And as long as you talk to them in an honest, age-appropriate manner, then you can talk about death from the time they're three years old. And when they get to be teenagers and in their early 20s, and you need to talk about your plans, they won't run from you. Yes. They'll embrace you and say thank you. Yes. And talk about it more. And talk about it, yeah. And really, I talk about that too and say, there's no reason why you shouldn't be talking to your teenagers and your 20-year-olds as well. Exactly. Because something could happen to them in a blink of an eye. Oh, I know. There's just so much, so much more that goes on around us now that we're subject to. So much more than when I was a kid. Yes. And I don't know if it's because we see it. Now, I think or... I think technology has a lot to do with it. Yeah. It's on the internet, it's on the news channels, it's everywhere. Yeah. It's absolutely. Everywhere. Well, that's Definitely. very lovely and I think everybody should listen to Kathy on that one for sure, for definitely for sure. Thank you. So, thank you for that kind those kind words. That's that's awesome. Oh. And everybody, we are not Superman, but we act like we are because nothing's going to happen, right? Right. We're invincible. We're, we're all that and a slice of bread. <laughs> yeah. But you know, that's far from the truth. And we can look at the last five years in the world around us and see the shootings in the school. And, you know, there's no country or state or province or city that's avoiding that because it's everywhere. Um, work accidents, car accidents, overdoses, the pandemic, mm-hmm. not to mention the crazy wars. Oh, and yeah. all of the natural disasters, the wildfires and the hurricanes and the floods around the world. And we're just not prepared even for an insurance company documentation. And that's all included in your backup plan app. No matter, I have thought of anything. All what ifs mm-hmm. are in the app. So you don't have to think, you just have to read it and do it. So don't forget to smash that like button. Um, we love to have you on board our shows. We thank you for sharing and um, around with those that you love and subscribe to our channel. And if you are thinking about that special someone right now watching the show and you haven't talked to them in a while, please reach out to them. Please mm-hmm. knock on their door phone them. We still have phones, text them, what, whatever it is, but reach out to them today because you don't yeah. know what tomorrow will bring. Mm-hmm. And that being said, we, Kathy doesn't know it, but we always end with Carol Burnett. <laughs> I know, you know who Ka- Carol Burnett is. Yeah. I'm so glad we had this time together just to have a laugh 
or sing a song. Seems we just get started. And before you know it, comes a time we have to say so long. <laughs> so long, everybody. Thank you, Kathy. Bye. Again. Oh, thank you for having me. Take You're care, everyone. Thank you. Bye -bye. Nice, nice to have you guys. Stay safe. Be kind. Till next time. See you soon.